Okay, so welcome everyone to our latest Partners in Progress Connect webinar. My name is David Sherwood, Commercial Director for Oceania with EW Nutrition. Today's webinar is Coccidiosis, Current Control Programs and New Alternatives. And our special guest speaker for today is Dr. Brian Jordan from University of Georgia. Brian, could you please introduce yourself? Hi everybody, my name is Brian Jordan. I'm an Associate Professor at the University of Georgia in the College of Veterinary Medicine and the Department of Poultry Science. Thanks, Brian. And also today as panelist and speaker, we have Madalena Diakonu, Product Manager for Pre-Tech D with EW Nutrition. And as panelist, RJ Boyer, Global Technical Manager for Poultry with EW Nutrition. Uh, Madalena, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, uh, thank you for being here. Welcome everybody. Thanks, Madalena. And RJ, could you also please introduce yourself as well, please? Sure. Good morning, uh, everybody. Thanks for participating in this uh, webinar. And I am your panelist. I'm Dr. Ajay Boyer. I am a Global Technical Manager for EW Nutrition for poultry, and I'm based, I'm based at St. Louis, USA. I look forward to have a great uh, session from Brian here. Thank you. Thanks, Ajay. And yeah, special thanks to all of our panelists and speakers uh, for all three, Brian, Madalena and RJ, it's, we're all of them, it's either very late at night or in the middle of the night for them. So uh, thanks very much for, for uh, taking the time to, to do this webinar for us. Um, so the outline of the webinar, what we'll do is we'll have Dr. Jordan's presentation first, um, and then followed by a presentation by Madalena. And, um, and then after that, we'll have a Q&A session and the way to, to ask questions is to click on the Q&A button on your screen and uh, there's a, there's a Q&A uh, chat um, and you can type in your questions there. And you can type in the questions anytime. You don't have to wait till the end. You can type in during the presentations and, uh, and then the panelists and speakers will, uh, will attempt to answer those questions live during the Q&A session. And also, if we don't have time to answer them li live, we will uh, reply via by email later on. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Jordan. So Brian received a Bachelor's of Science in Agriculture and a PhD in Poultry Science from the University of Georgia, where his PhD was dedicated toward adapting molecular genome manipulation techniques to poultry. After completion of his PhD, Brian spent two years in the laboratory of Dr. Mark Jackwood at the Poultry Diagnostic and Research Center as an assistant research scientist. Brian was then hired as an assistant professor of poultry health and production and promoted to associate professor. For the last 10 years, Brian's major emphasis was directed towards research and helping the commercial poultry industry control and combat diseases of poultry. Brian has especially focused on vaccine application and efficacy. His work has led to the development of a hatchery spray review protocol alongside a vaccine take surveillance program which has been used by many commercial hatcheries to improve their IBV and coccidia vaccine success. So welcome, Brian, and thank you very much again. And uh, could you please start your presentation? Thanks. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me today in, uh, to come give this presentation. So we are going to talk a little bit about poultry coccidiosis today, and, and we're going to review some of the biology of coccidiosis and coccidia and, and talk a little bit about what control strategies and programs that we have available. And then we're gonna finish discussing kind of where the science is going and where the industry is going as far as controlling uh, Imeria and then the subsequent um, you know, clostridial bacterial infections that come after an Imeria infection. So to the basic review on coccidiosis, which I'm sure you are all you know, aware, uh, it's caused by parasitic prosa of the Imeria species, uh, we call coccidia. Um, it's an economically significant enteric disease. Uh, it can lead to a variety of different clinical presentations, but uh, poor pea conversion, poor weight gain are common. Um, you can have uh, actual necrosis of the intestinal lining. You can have hemorrhage and necrosis in the cecum with Imeria tenella. So the, the presentation, the clinical presentation is going to vary depending on which species of Imeria you're having a challenge with. But a major component of the infection with Imeria, with coccidia, is actually the predisposition then to develop necrotic enteritis. 
And we actually see a lot more uh, mortality and economic impact, at least in the US, with necrotic enteritis as a secondary infection that is brought on by an infection, a subclinical infection with coccidiosis. So if we look at the Imeria, the coccidia themselves, means there are seven universally recognized species in commercial poultry. There are two other species not shown on this uh, graph that are sort of in dispute in the literature and among uh, academics as to where they are true species. And then here in the last few years, there have been three unique potential new species that have been identified in the Southern Hemisphere, um, particularly in India and Africa. Um, so we're going to mainly be talking about three, though. The one pictured in A, Imeria maxima, the one pictured in C, Imeria tenella, and the one pictured in F, Imeria a servilata. Those are the three main species that impact all sectors of our poultry production, layers, broiler breeders, and broilers. When we think about our longer lived birds, layers and broiler breeders, uh, we also then need to include the uh, Imeria in B, Imeria brunetti, and the one in D, Imeria nicatrix. Um, they are slower replicators, so they show up later in life. So you only really have an issue with those in longer lived birds. But, but all of these species have a different predilection for a different region of the gut. So you can actually identify them uh, by doing some microscopy and doing gut scrapings and, and looking at which region of the gut you identify with a servilina being located in the duodenal loop in the upper gut, uh, maxima being centralized and localized to the mid gut, Meckel's diverticulum is kind of your landmark there, uh, and then Tanella exclusively in the C gut. And then the Catrix also overlaps with uh, Maxima in the mid gut, but if we go back to that last graph, you can see they're very different sizes. And then Brunetti really occupies the colon, the large intestine portion of the gut. So it kind of has its own region there as well. Um, and when we think about the region of the gut and Imeria infection, the actual pathology, the mode of replication of the Imeria is what causes the disease. And particularly in what layer, cell layer that the Imeria replicate in. So if we look at our spore-related oocyst in figure two, that oocyst contains four sporocysts, and each sporocyst contains two sporozoites. And it's those sporozoites that actually infect the cells, replicate, produce more of these schizons or more of these immature um, you know, gametes for the oocyst that then go on and rupture cells, continue to replicate in other cells. And so it's, there's several cycles, if you look here, basically between steps four and steps 10 of asexual replication. And that's where all of the gut damage occurs. And so for species like Imeria, or Imeria acervilina that replicate in the tips of the villi, uh, it doesn't do a whole lot of damage. But for species like Imeria maxima or Imeria tenella that replicate very deep in the submucosa, when those cells rupture, it causes everything else, the villi, the epithelial cells, everything on top of that cell layer to be lost. And so we go through several rounds of asexual replication. We follow that up with a round of sexual replication. Then we have the release of a new mature oocyst that then goes to the litter to be sporulated. Right? So because of these multiple cycles of replication and that each one of these cycles of replication is causing gut damage, there's a lot of cost associated with an Imeria infection. And so for a long time, the number that we looked at was this 3 billion US dollars number. And that was a figure that was published in 1999 that was actually using statistics and dollar values from 1995. But up until really last year, that was the number we had. In last year, a new paper was published that basically redid the same analysis with a little bit new, uh, different parameters and new evaluations. And they estimated that the value, the cost of coccidia infection has increased to 14.4 billion US dollars per year in 2016 dollars, right? So we're still about five years behind in the value of our money, if that makes sense. And if we calculate that out to every bird produced in the world, that, that equates to about 22 cents per chicken produced is the cost of an Imeria infection. Now, that average is going to be skewed a little bit by whether we're discussing layer versus broiler breeder versus broiler. The cost may be more or less depending on bird sector. 
uh, and region in the world, but that's still a pretty significant cost, even if we just average it across the entire industry, 22 cents per bird. And so I'd like to show you a table uh, from that manuscript, from that paper. And this is um, a very interesting table because it breaks all of the costs down by region. And then it gives you an example country in that region and the cost of coccidiosis for that example country. So you can see how the numbers are extrapolated. Sorry, so in the oceanic region, they use New Zealand in this case as the example country. And it's showing that it's 16.34 million pounds per year of cost, right? So that's a pretty significant, pretty significant cost there that you can extrapolate out into other countries uh, in that region, depending on the number slaughtered per region, right? But you can see there's a range of 21% there. So it could be higher or lower depending on where you are in that region. And, and that range is pretty similar across all countries. Uh, but this is a very good, very good paper. They actually break these numbers down based on broilers, layers, breeders, number produced, production system, weight gain. They evaluate all those different metrics. Um, so I would highly suggest going and taking a look at that if you are more interested in individual costs and individual production metrics. Because coccidia infection and the disease caused by coccidia and then the subsequent diseases that can be you know, predisposed for with coccidia infection, we do our best to try to control the infection. We've got several tools for control of Imeria. We've got chemical anti-coccidials, ionophore anti-coccidials, and coccidiosis vaccines. And these are the three, three tools that we use to act directly on the Imeria species themselves. So if we look at sort of a timeline of the development of these different products, we see uh, at first, the first things to be developed are actually our sulfa drugs in the 1930s, 1940s, up until about 1950. Then those are shown in black. And then we get into some of our chemical compounds uh, in the really 1950s through the 1960s, which are shown in blue. Then we start the development and the production of our ionophore compounds, which are shown in red. But if you look at the timeline, the last new chemical or ionophore anticoccidial that we have was developed in 1999. So we are 22 years since the last new product has come to market um, that fall in one of these categories. So that kind of, kind of tells us that um, maybe there aren't any new products in these areas coming out. Uh, perhaps modes of action have been saturated for these types of products. And as we'll talk about later, there's some government regulation going on on some of these products as well. So we're gonna have to start thinking a little bit differently. But if we talk about each one of these individually and kind of discuss their pros and cons, we start with ionophore anticoxidials. Um, they are actually weak antibiotics. They have a weak antibiotic activity. And they are leaky, is what we say. They allow some coccidia infection, infection and cycling to occur. So they don't completely prevent infection. They don't kill every oocyst that gets into the bird. Uh, but this leakage really has minimal effects on performance. And it allows some replication of the coccidia so that the bird can develop some immunity. Um, because those coccidia are under less selective pressure from the ionophore, um, you get prolonged activity because they are going to mutate slower, and so you can use them for a longer time. They also have some gram-positive bacteria control, which is great because our clostridium that causes the chronic enteritis is a gram-negative enteric bacteria, so you get some of that control as well. Help promote just generally a good, healthy gut. Uh, for a long time since their introduction, they've been the backbone of coccidia control. And there are several reasons for their success. Um, the control of coccidia infection remains good, even though we've used them fairly continually and for quite a long time. Performance results are dependable and predictable. You basically know how your flock is going to perform gut health wise. Uh, it promotes generally good gut health. As I mentioned earlier, you get coccidia and clostridium control and they're reasonably priced, right? So there are a lot of, of pros to using these ionophore anticoxidials. But there are some drawbacks. There are some toxicity issues for some products. Some products you cannot use in layers or breeders versus broilers. And so you have to be aware of that, knowing where your feed's being produced, making sure the ionophores at the right levels are being mixed in the proper feed. 
Um, eventually, if you use them long enough, you will build resistance. You can't use a product forever without ever cycling. So you will build some resistance. But this is really the big drawback to ionic forge. They are considered antibiotics in many countries. And depending on the level of antibiotic use your country allows for antibiotic-free production, you may or may not be able to use them. In the United States, for example, they are considered antibiotics. And so if you use antibiotic, or if you are producing antibiotic-free chicken, you cannot use ionophore anticoxidables. However, in other places around the world, ionophores are listed as antibiotics of non-human relevance, which, and so they're still allowed to be used in antibiotic-free poultry production, right? So in some, in some areas of the world, this may be a bigger uh, drawback, a bigger negative, but it is something that eventually could affect all of us. So if we move on to our chemical anticoxidials, they are a very popular method of control. We see a lot more use of chemicals now, especially in the US, as the ionophores have been ruled out in our antibiotic reproduction systems. Um, our chemical anticoxidials are fairly cheap. They're relatively inexpensive. They are very effective. You get little or no coccidia cycling after a challenge, right? So it is, they are either, they, they can work in two ways. They can either be coccidia cycle, which means they kill the oocyst altogether. They can be coccidia static, which means they just inhibit the replication process. So the bird may still get infected, but those oocysts aren't going to replicate in the gut. But either way, you are not going to get any oocyst output and subsequent reinfection. Drawbacks though, they put a lot of selective pressure on those imeria, on the coccidia, because they basically shut down cycling and replication, those coccidia have to mutate and develop resistance very quickly if they're going to survive. And this has been reported in the literature, you can see it in production in the field, uh, that in as little as two flocks, you can actually develop resistance to some of these chemicals. There is no immunity developed by the bird because the cycling is completely shut down. The bird does not develop a proper immune response. So chemicals are not really an option for layers and breeders because they live so long. We need natural immunity in the birds to, to respond to an area infection. And as we mentioned earlier, there have not been any new chemicals brought to market in over 20, 20 plus years, right? Which would indicate that we are probably not going to see a lot of new products in this area moving forward. And then lastly, we come to coccidia vaccines. Okay, so uh, coccidia vaccines are actually live oocysts that we administer in a controlled dose uh, in the hatchery to chicks. Uh, the coccidia actually infect, they go through a normal replication cycle, they're shed into the litter, they sporulate in the litter, and then birds re-ingest those oocysts from the litter for another cycle of infection. You must have multiple rounds, multiple cycles of infection for full immunity develop. And that's the goal with coccidia vaccines is to develop that full immunity. Uh, vaccines can either be non-attenuated or they can be attenuated, also called precocious. Uh, in the US, we tend to use non-attenuated vaccines, but I believe most places in the world uh, use uh, precocious strains in their vaccines. And we'll discuss the differences here in just a second. But just to give you kind of a graphic, graphic representation, when you apply the vaccine in the hatchery, it's a low oocyst number, small dose, controlled dose. And then it takes about seven days for replication to fully occur. After seven days, those birds shed oocysts in the litter, they sporulate, they re-ingest a little bit larger amount this time than they received from their vaccination at day one. Then in the second cycle, again, full replication cycle, they shed a little bit more oocysts in the litter. They're picked up, ingested again, a little bit more this time than the first or the second time. Now we get into the third cycle. We go through that same replication cycle. They shed oocyst into the litter again. But at this point, the immunity should be developed if the cycling has occurred properly. So even though they're shedding a larger amount of oocysts back into the litter, those oocysts are basically rendered useless because the natural immune system of the bird will prevent any further infection and replication cycle. So one of the advantages for coccidia vaccines is they are the only tool that can really get induced full immunity. So for layers and breeders for birds that are going to live a long time where you cannot give them, you know, an ionophore chemical for the entire life of the bird, uh, vaccines are really the way to go. So you can rely on the bird's natural immune system. 
But success relies heavily on how well you apply your vaccine. You only get correct cycling if all the birds get exposed pretty routinely, routinely and uniformly at the same time with that low control dose of oocysts. The in-house management, where how you brood your birds, if we're talking about pullets, if they're in cages versus on the floor, um, all of those things can really influence and impact how well the cycling occurs of your vaccine and may actually render your vaccine not as effective. And then because some vaccines are not attenuated, they can induce lesions because they are infecting and replicating. So if the, the cycling is not controlled, then you may cause gut damage that can then end up leading to vaccine-induced uh, necrotic enteritis, which is not something that we want to do. Now, the danger in this is definitely reduced when you are using uh, precocious vaccines, precocious strains of Imeria in your vaccine. But you actually run an opposite risk when you use precocious strains because they are not as uh, voracious at infecting, they're not as fecund and, and going through replication cycles as non-precocious strains. You have to really be careful with your vaccine application to ensure that all the birds get vaccinated. Because if they don't, then you really don't develop the proper immunity there. So it's kind of a give and take on which, which end of the, of the spectrum you want to be on. So all of these tools that we have for controlling coccidia have advantages and disadvantages. And because um, some of these work in some systems and some of them work better in other systems, as an industry, we've kind of developed programs for the control of coccidia. So, so guidelines on how and where and when we use these different tools. All right, and some of these prevention programs we're gonna go through real quick. Uh, a stray program we would be referring to a chemical or an ionophore, but you just use the straight, the same drug, the same chemical or ionophore for the life of flock, all the way through into withdrawal. All right, very most simple control strategy. Uh, with a straight program, you may also run a rotation where you use the same drug for one flock, but then every flock or every other flock, you change which drug that is, right? So you're trying to just make sure that you don't, you know, develop immunity in your O's population in your house, uh, you know, make sure those chemicals and ionophores stay effective. Then you've got a sort of a combination of this where you have what's called a shuttle, where you may change within a cycle. So you may put start with an ionophore or a chemical in the grower diet, and then you put an ionophore in the finisher diet. Um, and that way you are allowing maybe no coccidia infection up front, where your big risk factor for necrotic enteritis is when the birds are younger. But then you want to allow a little bit of leakage later on so the birds do develop develop some immunity if they're going to be a little bit longer lived in the broiler span. Then we've got our vaccination that we just talked about. And, and with vaccines, you, you apply them at day of hatch and then you, you just leave them alone. You ensure that the cycling goes well, but you don't really do anything to them. But as I mentioned, sometimes vaccines can induce lesions on their own if that cycling isn't managed right. So what a lot of folks have gone to is what we call a bio shuttle, where you give the vaccine at day one, and then you follow up with an ion or or chemical in the feed, you know, typically when you switch to grower, a grower feed, so sometime around day 14 or day 15, to really just kind of knock down the level of replication of that second and really that third replication cycle, just to try to prevent gut damage, any gut damage from the vaccine while still allowing those first two cycles to go through and the bird to develop some immunity. So all of these different the, these different tools and programs are going to be used uh, a little bit differently. And we're going to go through, go through that as we continue the presentation. So just to recap, we've got the tools are our chemicals, ionophores, and vaccines. And a lot of places, ionophores aren't allowed anymore because of that no antibiotic rule for antibiotic free production. So in an effort to kind of, I don't want to say replace ionophores, but just to give us more tools to help keep a healthy gut and help maybe, you know, with some of that Imeria infection. A lot of research lately has gone into um, other compounds, plant compounds, butyric acids, extracts, things that basically aid in the prevention of gut disease or aid in the prevention of dysbiosis, things like that. Um, it's been a lot, major focus of research for parasitologists, for nutritionists, for a lot of different sectors in poultry. Um, really for the last decade or so. 
Uh, some of these products were kind of directly on the coccidia themselves. Um, most of them really help to maintain gut integrity, help maintain a healthy gut and reduce the impact of coccidia infection. All right, so let's talk a little bit about those. Um, the plant compounds, they tend to work by sort of inhibiting or influencing various stages of the life cycle of the coccidia when they infect. And in addition, they tend to have an anti-inflammatory effect as well. So the coccidia that I that do infect and replicate, um, the inflammation caused by that and the necrosis caused by that is, is going to be lessened, it's going to be reduced. Uh, so com some common examples of plant compounds are oregano, carbacrol, thymol, cinnamaldehyde, some, some of these terms you may have heard. And then we've got pre and probiotics, and they work really to modulate the gut microbiota, right, to maintain that healthy gut, prevent the dysbiosis. Um, some of these products may have some activity uh, and inhibit amiria replication, um, but that's not really their main mode of action. Uh, common prebiotics would be fructo, mannan, xylo, oligosaccharides. Uh, common probiotics are going to contain bacillus, lactobacillus, enterococcus, enterococcus bifidobacterium. All right, and so with these, you're trying to seed the gut with good bacteria, things that are going to help the bird help that, that uh, maintain that gut integrity. And then you've got your class of organic acids, fats, antioxidants, and they really do work by maintaining gut integrity and reducing lesions from Imeria infection. And I have a, a reference listed here if you're interested. This is a pretty good review on a lot of these different compounds and the, the way they, they uh, their mode of action. But some common products in this category are butyric acid and acetic acid, uh, polyunsaturated fats, which you know can be a flaxseed oil or a fish oil. Um, some of your amino acids like arginine can fall into this category. All right, so if we think about these different alternative products, things that we're going to use maybe in addition to our vaccines or in addition to our ionophoric chemicals. The question about, well, what product do I use? How do I use it? When do I use it? Gets brought up a lot, right? You need to know how to use these things in your operation. And the answer to that question is really going to vary from location to lo location, from control strategy to control strategy. And there's a lot of different factors that can influence which product you're going to use at what time and for how long. Right? But one of the major factors and one that's kind of common across all of these is your vaccine usage. So if you are using vaccine, uh, then that's going to be the main factor you consider. And then you work around that because because some of these products do have activity against your Imeria, you don't want to inhibit vaccine. You don't want to inhibit the activity and the immunity you're going to develop. All right, so that's, that's the whole point of using our vaccines. What you're trying to do is just help prevent and limit any kind of damage that the vaccine may cause. So I put together a couple, uh, a couple of, you know, maybe typical programs that you might run, let's say if you're using a coccidia vaccine. So you may start with a vaccine that's gonna be applied day one in the hatchery. You may wanna start with a prebiotic or a probiotic or some kind of organic acid in your starter, right? The first two weeks, two and a half weeks, you really wanna give that vaccine an opportunity to infect, replicate, be shed into the litter, get re-ingested, reinfect, so the bird is developing that immunity. And then when you switch your grower feed, that's where you can start thinking about putting in some of your plant compounds, putting in some of your phytomolecules that may or may not have some anti-coccidial activity, but really have a lot of activity in helping maintain that healthy gut, that healthy gut lining uh, from grower all the way through to withdrawal. You can leave those in all the way to the end. Um, actually, I was attended a seminar a few weeks ago uh, where someone was, was talking more specifically about these products. And there is definitely an additive benefit to leaving these products in for as long as you can, right? So just, just putting them in for a week here and a week there, you didn't see the same benefit as if you put these products in, um, left them in for as long as possible, potentially like a flock, you know, for broilers, let's say. Uh, but then especially if you do it multiple flocks, right? There's some very compelling data there to show that. Now, if we're looking at a program that's not using a vaccine, so let's say we're just using an ionophore and we want to help maintain that healthy gut, help with the little bit of leakage from the coccidia that you're going to get, 
Um, you can start from day one, from your starter with the plant compounds, your fiber molecules, continue those all the way through. Uh, you may add or switch to an organic acid in the grower at this point, add that into the diet, carry that through to the end. Um, but those, though, if you're not using a vaccine, you have a little bit more freedom in when you want you can put some of these compounds in uh, because you're not necessarily worried about the mechanism of action and interfering with a live host vaccine that you've just given. Okay, so to kind of tie all this together, uh, with Amiria control, because of the chemicals that we have, the onophores, the vaccines, and because of the regulations that we're under in a lot of cases, you know, we're really thinking that we're not going to be singularly focused on the parasite anymore. We aren't specifically looking for a new chemical that's going to inhibit a mode of action of Imeria, right? That's evident as we haven't had any new chemicals brought to market in the last 20 plus years, right? So there are a lot of factors that influence our ability to manage this disease, and we can manage around it with nutrition, with our antibiotic status, the healthy, the healthiness of the gut or the dysbiosis, the bacteria that are seeded into the gut and into the environment, um, the compounds, the products that we can use to help maintain tight junctions and help maintain villi, uh, villi integrity and villi crypt death ratio. You know, all these performance analytics that we look at in these studies. And so moving forward, and, and this is true, you know, for coccidia, but it's true really for a lot of other pathogens that we look at in poultry is, you know, we're taking a more systems approach, almost if you relate it to human medicine, human medicine, a one health idea where we understand that a lot of these systems are working together and there are other places we can target to help control or prevent, mitigate disease, infection, lesions, and then really improve performance. So coccidiosis control, as we know, can be difficult because we don't really have just one complete control therapeutic, right? All, as we mentioned earlier, all of our tools have advantages and disadvantages. Um, we often combine them, we put them together, we try to develop these programs, these strategies to alleviate any of those, any of those individual deficiencies. We try to, you know, uh, take the advantages of one product and add it together with uh, the advantages of the, another product and get a cumulative effect to try to control. Um, but we've got to start thinking about coccidia control, as I just mentioned, in that holistic way. Let's not just look at the Imeria, let's look at the bird too. And there, because there are ways, there's data showing that there are things we can do for the bird that's going to help them just naturally get through this infection. And so with that, uh, at the end, I believe we have a question and answer session. I'll answer questions as I can in, in the Q&A in the chat there. And I would like to thank you for allowing me to come uh, speak to you all today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, very nice presentation, very useful and easy to understand. So if I could um, have you to stop sharing your screen now, and then if I could ask Madalena to start sharing her screen. And we'll have Madalena's presentation then. Thanks. And also just a reminder to everyone, yeah, so we'll have the Q&A after Madalena's presentation. So uh, type in the questions to the Q&A box and uh, that's the only way to ask us questions during the webinar. And uh, yeah, we'll try to answer those live at the end. Otherwise um, you can uh, email us as well. I'll give the email address at the end. Okay, thanks. So, so do you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I can hear you, but we can't see your presentation yet. Sorry. Um. Still not. Yes, the presentation's there. We just. Uh, you just need to put it into the okay. slideshow mode. So it's okay now. Perfect. That's it. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Marlena. Thank you. So uh, just to continue what uh, Brian was explaining about uh, about coccidiosis and control programs, uh, today I will, uh, I will present our solution for uh, controlling um, coccidiosis. Our product is called uh, Pretec-D. So it's our own solution for um, 
coccidiosis or controlling coccidiosis is a unique blend of phytomolecules that is including also saponins and tannins. Our trial uh, results showed a different type of activities of this product, antiprotosal activity, anti-inflammatory and also immunomodulatory and antioxidant. So Pritec D can be efficiently uh, in a control program that you have by impairing the immeria development cycle by effectively reduce the spread of the disease and decreasing the oocytes excretion. Also, by protecting the epithelium from inflammatory and oxidative damage, and also by promoting the restoration of the mucosal barrier function. Most important, Pretec D can be used in combination with vaccine, ionophores, chemicals, as a part of the hradal or rotation programs. So, in the next slides, I will present you our trials results. So, in all the trials, we showed improved performance uh, production. We also show better intestinal morphology, reduced oocyte sheeting and lesion scoring, and also the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect. One of the tr first trials that was done was done in the United States. We used COP500, all type of Humeria challenge. So we used Acervulina Maxima and Tenella. And you can see that in the, in the results, the fin final body weight of Pretec D group was higher compared with the Yonofor group or compared with the challenge one. Also the FCR at 35 days, it's clearly higher or lower than the Yonofor group and also the challenge group and the European uh, performance efficiency factor, it's uh, clearly different than the than the others, sorry, just a second. Uh, it's clearly different than the Eurofor group and also the challenge group. It's very important in this specific trial, we used 1000 gram of Pretec D and uh, the trial was done in the United States. Another trial that was already also done in the United States, in this case with the vaccinated broilers, we check the body weight, the average body weight at each feed range and we can see uh, in the results that we have a significantly uh, higher body weight in each moment of the of the feed change. And we can also see the U European efficiency uh, performance in this that it's for sure better uh, for PTECD than the control group. Also, the feed conversion ratio, we can see a difference of six points between PTECD and control group. So for sure, PTECD can be used in combination with vaccine without any problem and can for sure bring even more to your program. Another trial that was done, we were checking for the antioxidant uh, index and also the USAIS fecal input. So you can see here the results regarding the superoxidismutase and the total antioxidant effect and MDA, lower level of MDA, the, indicati the indicator of oxidative stress, it's for sure better for pretec D. So we have a significant difference between pretec D group and the challenge group. Again, in this, uh, in this trial, the change was done with Etanella because we all know how important lesions Etanella will, uh, will have at the level of cecum. So we, we challenged the, the groups with uh, um, Emeria Tenella. Also, if we take a look at the superoxidis mutase and the total antioxidant index, you can see that the group with Pretec D had significant higher results than uh, the, control, the control group and the challenge one. Also, we check for the fecal output, the oocytes, and we can see here that we have more than 50% reduction in the oocytes fecal output with the use of Pretec D. You will see in the next slide, you will see in the next slide the results regarding the uh, intestinal morphology, more specific, the cytokine profile. So compared with the challenge group, the lower level of interleukin cis and TNF-alpha were absorbed. These are the two pro-inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines, 
uh, cytokines that we have, and also the high level of interleukin uh, 10, that it's an anti-inflammatory uh, interleukin, shows us the reduced injury in the gut with the use of PRETEC-D. Also, you can see here in the right, the results regarding the villus height and creep depth uh, between the non-challenge group, challenge group, and also PRETEC-D, the uh, two dosages. We can see that we can keep the ration, we can keep the ration of villus and creep depth almost at the same level with the non-challenge group. In this specific trial, as you can see here, we use two different types of dosages. We use PRETECT at 500 grams per metric tons and also at 1,000 grams. But let's go further to see what are the results from the other, one of the other studies that was done in the United States using PRETECT during the whole period from day 0 to day 35. And you can see here the average lesion score, it's clearly reduce and significant difference there is a significant difference between the challenge control again challenge with all three types of hemeria and the group of pretec d and also the group of ionophore also you can see here that the number of inflammated ill payer patches was lower for pretec d even lower than ionophore's group or the challenge control and compared with the non-challenge control, we have almost the same level. That means that all this trial can also show us the anti-inflammatory effect of pretec d But let's go further and see what's about the OPT counter day 35. You can see that compared with the challenge group, we have a significantly lower results and we have almost the same results like the ionophore in this specific in this specific trial but we would re, uh, we want to know what's going on at customer level so this specific uh, trial was done at uh, in europe in a customer a field trial we had more than 200,000 broilers split it in 10 houses so we have five houses like a control and five houses with PRETEC-D program, the five houses were having narazine and nicarbazine together from, the, uh, from day one until day 21 and salinomycin from day 22 until day 33 or 35. And for the PRETEC-D program, we kept narazine and nicarbazine until day 21 and we use PRETEC-D to one kilo from day 22 to day 32, and after we went for the withdrawal period with 0 0.5 kilos from day 35 to day 42. In this specific trial, you can see the mortality was reduced by 0.7%. And also we can have three points, three points difference in FCR. The same for the body weight. Regarding the body weight, we can we, we win in this specific customer trial almost 200 grams in body weight. So for sure, the European performance efficiency factor can be easily explained by all the other so technical factors. But let's see what's going on at the level of Imeria in this uh, specific farm. Uh, the higher levels of lesion score and OPGs were observed even at the beginning of the trial. So uh, after the use of PRETEC-D at day 22, so we start at day 22, you can see that from the first day of using PRETEC-D until the end of the cycle, we have a clearly reduction, even better than the control group with the classical control program of the client. Also regarding the lesion scoring, you can see here that from the very beginning, the houses that were treated with uh, pretec D were, were having higher levels of lesions and uh, compared with the control. But if we take a look at day, day 35 with the classical control program, we are almost at foreign lesion score. And with the use of pretec D, we can see already a reduction of one point in lesion scoring. And by the end of the cycle, at day 42, compared with the control, group we have a complete reduction we have 50 percent less lesions 
and not even we are not even a two in lesion scoring. So taking all these results in account, we recommend a different type of application. We recommend different type of uh, using and a potential application of pretech depending on your control program and also depending on how you adapt or you have your shuttle and rotation programs in your farms so first uh, the first program that we recommend can be pretech d can be used only in finisher for the withdrawal period when we know that most of the time we don't have the the right to use Ionophores or chemicals, and still coccidia is there, so the chick is still need uh, a protection. One of the second, uh, the second type of programs that are most common today, it's keeping a coccidia stat, even if it's a ionophore or a, or a chemical, in the first three weeks of the of the cycle or first two weeks if you want, and going further until the end of the cycle with pretec D. Another type of program, the third one, it's pretend replacing another natural solution without any problem. Or if you want, for example, to go ionophore free or chemical free, you can go step by step, introducing the product step by step in your actual program and in the end going further for a non chemical or ionophore period with pretend D during the whole cycle. One of the uh, less program application that we are also recommending is together with vaccine. We all know the benefits of the vaccine and we also recommend pretec D can be used with together with the vaccine from 14 to 21 days. We let the vaccine uh, do his job. We keep the immunity. We take the immunity that it's offered only by the vaccination and we go further with pretec D to make sure that we have a complete program that will protect our birds. So Pretec D, the recommended dose, it's today 500 grams per metric tons. It has a very good shelf life of 24 months and the packaging today it's 20 kilos uh, uh, bags. So taking all this in account, I would just like to uh, end my, my presentation by saying that Pretec D can be a potential tool in your coccidiosis program, can make your coccidiosis program more effective because as you saw, we have beneficial microbial population, we can improve the beneficial microbial population, we can also improve the immune response against Imeria with a better gut barrier function and for sure, we can reduce the replication and growth of humeria. We can also reduce the mucosal inflammation and the harmful microbial population in the gut. So Pretec D can shortly be the tool to make your concilia program more effective. Time for question and answer. So please, if you have questions, don't hesitate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madalena. It's a very nice overview of some of the research that EW Nutrition is doing in this area. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Ajay now uh, and the uh, with uh, Brian and Madalena to um, review the, the questions and uh, respond to those. So thanks, Ajay. Thank you, uh, David. And uh, I could see that uh, there are already questions and the answers provided by Brian. So Brian, thank you very much for providing the written answers. And um, But for the sake of um, the audience um, which are participating in this webinar, um, I would like to um, repeat those questions and then Brian, you can answer so that uh, uh, multiple audience can, um, can have the uh, their view is clear. So um, the first question I would take is uh, um, the effect of part house brooding on vaccinated broilers. So what would be the effect of that? 
Right, so partial house brooding, um, it can be uh, a beneficial tool for managing coccidiosis cy or vaccine cycling and infection, um, but it can also be detrimental if it's done improperly. So some of the main considerations to, to take into account when you are uh, when you're looking at partial house brooding is litter management's a big one. Um, oftentimes when we you know, partial house brood, um, especially in the winter time when it's cooler, maybe moist, more moist, the litter can get too wet. And if the litter gets very wet, then you're gonna have much quicker sporulation of the oocyst. That's gonna lead to more rapid reinfection and potentially over infection um, and, and over cycling of your vaccine. Um, alternatively, if you're in a very dry region and your litter is too dry, then you are not going to get sporulation at all. And so those oocysts are still going to get reinjected, but they won't be effective, right? So you basically have stopped your own vaccine from cycling. But typically too dry is not the issue. It's too wet that is the issue when you partial house brood. Uh, the other thing to consider is when you're going to turn those birds out. So if your plan is to turn out birds at seven days of age, uh, well, then you just turned all those birds out to the rest of your house that has no oocyst presence in the litter, particularly not from your vaccine because the birds are shedding vaccine in the partial house, right? So what you're really doing is potentially exposing those birds to any Imeria field challenge that may be present in your house. So if you're going to partial house brood, you want to try to wait and turn those birds out around day 10 or 11 to get that full first replication cycle, shedding into the litter, sporulation in the litter, and then re-ingestion to occur and let the birds be in that internal second replication cycle when you turn them out. So then they'll start shedding oocysts, you know, four to five days later in the entirety of the house, wherever they are. Alternatively, if you really don't want to wait that long, then you need to go probably before day six or by day six at the latest um, so that you are going to turn the birds out and they will shed oocyst into the litter wherever they are in the house, not just in the partial house where they were brooded so that they can then sporulate and be readjusted to continue that vaccine cycle. Yeah. And uh, then I will go to the open question, Brian, and there is a question related to the use of betaine. And is there any benefit of using betaine in terms of coccidiosis prevention or control? Right. Um, so I, there, I'll be honest, betaine is not something that I've done, done work with in the past. Um, I've sat on some committees of students that have used it as different uh, components of the diet. Um, so I probably, I don't really have a great answer on betaine. I definitely would, would, uh, consult a nutritionist or maybe someone I could put them if you know they wanted to share their or share my contact information we can um, I can put them in touch with one of our nutritionists who's done some more work directly with that product yeah thank you Brian and um, what, one question from my side Brian how long it takes generally to reduce the resistance to a coccidiostat after um, giving it a red rest or stopping its use so how long does it take to basically restore sensitivity? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I, I don't know that we have a defined answer to that. Um, if you look in the literature, there aren't a lot of studies that are measuring that factor specifically. Um, typically, if, if you are talking to veterinarians in the field, they may have a wintertime program where they're using a strong chemical just because they don't want any coccidia cycling. And then they'll move to a summertime program where they're using vaccine to replenish the vaccine, which are sensitive oocysts population um, in the house. Now, if you have a true, you know, multi-drug resistant population of oocysts in your farm, um, it more than likely would take a year, maybe more to fully restore sensitivity with vaccine. But it's really hard to measure because we don't have any genetic markers that can tell us which oocysts are sensitive and which aren't. That's actually something that we're trying to work on in our lab right now. Um, all you can do are anti-coccidial sensitivity tests, ASTs, which are you know kind of time-consuming, labor-intense, and a little bit expensive. But that's the only real way to know. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. One more question, Brian, and you have already provided the answer, but uh, I think this would be an interesting question. 
So there are different feeding programs with starter and grower rations. So what age the plant compounds uh, slash probiotics would be recommended? And I believe the recommendation would be different for plant compounds and probiotics that you have already mentioned in your one of the slides. Right. Yeah. So for the probiotic part, um, the age factor is not as much of an influential. Most of our, the probiotics we have are not going to, and, and really the consideration is your coccidia vaccine. So the probiotics are not going to influence um, your coccidia vaccine. They're there to promote good gut microbiota, a healthy population of gut bacteria. Um, your phytoceuticals, phytochemicals, plant compounds, things like that, that could potentially have a mechanism of action on the coccidia. Um, so then the timing would be after 14 days of age, probably, you know, most of the time when you're switching to grower, it's going to be sometime in that window in that time period. And so that's just the easiest time point to add that to your next lot of feed. But if you're looking for a specific day, I would say 15 days old or later, because then you've allowed your coccidia vaccine to get through two cycles, finishing up its second cycle of infection and replication. So you've been able to, you know, get the stimulation of immunity really going in the bird, um, even if then that chemical or compound, whatever you add, does have some anti-coccidial activity to it. It's not going to completely stop infection. So you're still going to get that third cycle to finish off that immunity development. Um, but you, you've allowed two cycles uninhibited um, to really stimulate the immune system. So I would say 15 days or older. Yeah. Uh, one more question from my side, Brian. Um, in, in Southeast Asia, Pacific, uh, in many countries, the coccidiosis vaccine is not used. So they generally use uh, the uh, shuttle program or rotation program. So in, in, in that case, uh, what would be your recommendation to reduce the losses uh, when these coccidiostats are removed uh, from the feed? In the withdrawal period. I'm sorry, VJ. Could you, or I'm sorry, AJ. Could you, um, could you repeat the first part of the question? I missed the first part. So my question is, uh, I think let me cut cut it short a little bit. Like, what would be your recommendation uh, to avoid or to reduce the losses, um, particularly when the coccidiostats are removed from the feed in the withdrawal period? So you so, don't have coccidial stats, but there are right. gut health issues. Right. So once the coccidial stat has to be removed for the withdrawal, and then you see Imeria infection coming in late and causing production issues. Yeah. So that can be one of two things. Um, I'm assuming if they're using some sort of coccidial stat, they're not using a vaccine, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So we're not considering like a late cycling vaccine issue. Um, so in that scenario, then number one, you've obviously got a field challenge so that you know those oocysts are coming in late. So you can do things in the house to help mitigate the oocyst imeria presence in the house. So there's literature, it's been shown that even doing full clean outs don't remove all the oocysts that are present, but they will reduce the load. So if that is a continual flock after flock issue, um, doing a full house clean out could be something uh, that you would consider. Um, what actually does work better than a full house clean out is uh, wind rowing your litter. So basically composting your litter in house, heating that up. Um, if the litter is wet at all, which it kind of needs to be to, to get a proper temperature for wind rowing, you will actually uh, release the, the um, ammonia that's in the litter. And ammonia is very potent at destroying oocysts. So you can treat your litter in that way between flocks to help reduce the, the coccidial load in the litter. Um, if it's a well-managed farm, you don't think it's a litter situation, you know, it's, you, you wanna try something else. And that's the, what you're describing is really an opportunity for the products that we've talked about here to kind of come through and just to help maintain that, that good gut integrity when you go, when you're on that finisher or withdrawal diet. Uh, to get those birds to the plant so that you're not taking any late performance hits. But that would that would that would be a really opportune time to use these products um, just to help maintain that good uh, that good environment. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for sharing your experiences and uh, I think we are nearing uh, to the end of this webinar. I would uh, ask uh, David.
to yes if you want to conclude it thank you ajay yes um uh, that's very good thanks for your uh, for yourself and for brian and madalena for your time and giving us uh sharing your knowledge. So um, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and uh, for your questions. And if you do think of questions um, you'd like to ask us, just uh, email them to the email address on the screen there, webinar at ewnutrition.com. And um, there'll be a recording of this webinar on our website in a couple of days. And uh, there will be other webinars in the future from EW Nutrition on other topics as well. So I uh, hope you can join us then and thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.